I am Oscar winner David Berry, and this is The Great Movie Show. At The Great Movie Show, we celebrate all the work that goes into a movie. Whilst it's easy to concentrate on actors and maybe the directors, there are thousands of people who are often involved in the movie making process to bring the finished article to the screen. Behind the scenes is about the people you don't see. We're joined today by a visual effects Oscar winner, someone who in the late 70s and early 80s was at the cutting edge of visual effects. He was part of the industrial light and magic team that brought us Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and also Raiders of the Lost Ark, Cocoon, and The NeverEnding Story. It's my great pleasure to welcome another Dave to the show, Mr. David Berry. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you for joining us all the way from sunny San Francisco. I'm honored to be here. This is genuinely my first interview. <laughs> You're going way down the totem pole to get to me, but uh, yes, it's all true. It's, uh, we're honored, it, it, we're it, honored to great. have you. Um, a, a quick shout out um, at the start. Um, the reason why originally um, you were contacted is because one of our usual co-hosts, Dave Berry, um, has followed your work, having been interested in seeing what he believed to be his name on a number of films that he grew up liking over the years. Um, so he reached out and contacted you and you very kindly um, arranged to, to, to be involved in this process. So um, unfortunately, Dave can't ironically be with us this evening but uh, you are our honorary David Berry this evening so thank you yeah as fate would have it IMDB lists you in the visual effects category but it, it states that you've had a number of roles Dave um I think between 1977 and 85 um you have worked as a camera operator on Close Encounters an optical printer op operator and miniature and optical effects unit in a number of films. You worked as a lineup technician, and I think you also worked as a visual effects optical supervisor. I anticipate that there are a lot of things in films that we've seen that um, you've been part of the process of. Um, people tend not to get the same uh, recognition by the public maybe, but in industry, um, they will. Um, I, I, I think, um, as an optical printer, it might be the public doesn't really know what that that is or, or, or what that entails. So what is an optical printer and what would be uh, the role of, say, an optical printer supervisor, Dave? Well, uh, in, uh, an optical printer is basically uh, a very specialized camera, uh, a fixed camera that's pointed at a projector. So you're refilming, you're rephotographing a previously photographed image. Like the most obvious example in Star Wars would be shooting an actor against a blue screen and replacing the background with something else uh, and or shooting a miniature spacecraft against a blue screen and then replacing the background with a, a star field or anything that you want. And uh, of course, the, the optical process is uh, necessary in order to uh, do that. And uh, it uses uh, film processing uh, techniques, creating mats and color separations and uh, different elements that you combine. It, it's a lot of tedious work, uh, keeping track of a lot of, uh, you know, keeping a lot of elements in synchronization uh, that uh, to produce, and then uh, color timing is really essential. Uh, and it's uh, it's all done digitally today, but back in the old days, it was done using an optical printer, uh, which is, a, a, again, a specialized uh, sort of uh, re-photography device. What's, what's the worst description of an optical printer ever, but uh, I wish I had a picture. You can cut in a picture of one. Yeah, I'll put one in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to go back on the credit thing uh, and give Lucas a, a little thank you because uh, before Star Wars, uh, all the people who were optical printer operators or miniature uh, 
uh, camera operators, shooting miniatures or stop motion animators uh, typically didn't get credits in films. And uh, Lucas, to his credit, gave everybody working at Industrial Light and Magic, even the janitor, uh, got a credit. And that kind of set a trend because all the big effects films after that point uh, have uh, big end credit sequences, which have grown substantially over the years uh, to the point where you look like you're looking at a telephone book, uh, a virtual <laughs> army of effects technicians that it takes to create these types of films. But back in the old days, uh, uh, it would just be mainly the effects supervisor would get credit and that would be it. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I, you know, not to ramble on, but uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, received an Academy Award for uh, 2001 for the special effects. And uh, in a way, he was the effects supervisor. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't uh, you neglect Douglas Trumbull and uh, – uh, Tom Howard and uh, Con Pedersen, uh, the other people. I think today they all would have gotten Academy Awards. I guess yeah. back in that day, they only gave the Oscar to one person. That, yeah, that, big name, that's I the, guess, at that time. Yeah, one one of the things I, I was interested in um, reading up on, on various things to do with uh, ILM particularly, Dave, is that, um, it, it appeared that almost exactly as, as you're saying, that there wasn't the sort of recognition in the late 70s in, in relation to this kind of work. In fact, um, it seems that although there was some some real work in the the 30s with King Kong, and then moving into the 40s and 50s, I think it was the Acme Dunn printer in the 40s that was mass produced. Um, towards the end of the 70s, the, the the use of optical printing seemed to be waning. Um, and whether this is true or not, you might be able to say it seemed that. Um, one of the things George Lucas was concerned about was the fast moving um, effects that he wanted. He thought couldn't be achieved any other way than sort of really looking again at optical printing and, and trying to perfect that. And you've mentioned um, um, 2001. I understand he went to um, Trumbull and, um, and said, you know, could you help us on this project? And he said, I can't. I think he was working on Close, close Encounters or, or the, the, the start of that. Um, but he suggested, um, John, is it Dykstra or Dykstra? I don't want to say his name wrong. Is it Dykstra? John Dykstra. Um, and, and he brought people together, uh, I understand. And that's one of the things that, that, that was formed as part of the, the visual effects department of, of ILM. Um, and it seemed to me that that was the sort of kernel of an idea that then developed the 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 type of machines that were were necessary in order for you to to achieve the the effect that that George Lucas wanted. Is that right? Uh, well, I think that's that's very fair and generous uh, take on that. Uh, of course, I wasn't involved in the setting up the pipeline, so to speak. But uh, you know, it was. Uh, Back in the old days, like the Flash Gordon uh, serials uh, uh, or, uh, you know, World War II movies uh, that involved uh, miniature airplanes and things like that, uh, they tended to film them all on wires. Uh, so the, the planes would actually be flying on suspended wires uh, and then photographed in a big miniature set. And they took a very different approach on Star Wars where the miniatures were mounted on a pylon. Uh, and then instead of flying the miniature around, they flew the camera around uh, and then uh, and shot the miniature against a blue screen and then uh, later replaced the background. So that, that would enable them to get realistic uh, motion blur on the miniatures. But uh, that motion blur is very hard to... Uh, it's very hard to work with in the optical process. But I remember the first shot uh, I saw uh, of a tie ship. Uh, it came through, I, when I first started working at uh, ILM and Van Nuys, I was in the rotoscope department and we had to create, uh, you probably heard this term garbage mats uh, because uh, the blue screen would only cover a small part of the scene and then all the other stuff had to be masked out, all the stuff on stage, the lights, unwanted things that got into the shot. And animation would make a simple mat uh, 
called a garbage mat to uh, to do that. And uh, I remember the very first TIE fighter I shot, I did a garbage mat for. It was so blurred. <laughs> it, was just, it just looked like a streak of blur. Uh, you couldn't make out any detail on it at all. They, they cut back on the amount of blur after that. It, it was a learning process. Yeah. They had to develop the technology. And then uh, I, I think uh, Robbie Blalek, who was uh, head of the optical department, uh, likened it to uh, jumping out of an airplane with a pair, uh, with not having a parachute, but having to assemble the parachute <laughs> while you're in free fall. And get it all assembled and, and on and, and opened before you land. So, and that's kind of like what it was like working on the first Star Wars. I think you've you mentioned rotoscope. I think um, we've heard that phrase or that word being used in relation to the the lightsaber technique. Is that something yeah. that you you worked on or, or you, you know no. about? The lightsabers in the first Star Wars. Uh, were shot, uh, they were solid like lightsabers that had a, a shaft or a blade that was covered in front screen projection material. And uh, they later had to be enhanced. Uh, and, uh, you know, animators came in and put in uh, the glowing uh, blue glow that went around the lightsabers. Uh, and that we didn't do that at ILM. Those were, those were all shot in regular 35 millimeter anamorphic film, what we referred to as four perf. Uh, and uh, those were done outside of ILM. I'm not exactly sure who did those. I want to say Nina Saxon, uh, but uh, I know she did all the uh, handgun laser shots. Right. And those were also done uh, outside of ILM. So I actually did uh, one laser uh, 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 lightsaber shot in uh, in Return of the Jedi, uh, and uh, but that was just because that particular shot had elements that were done in Vista Vision, so we had to. Uh, and at the time, Pete Coran, who had worked in the original Star Wars and Empire, and then went off to set up his own company, was uh, subcontracting uh, some lightsaber shots on Return of the Jedi. So I worked with Peak Moran to do the uh, that particular shot. So in terms of um, the, um, the the way in which you you produce these things, I think um, it's a a repurposed Howard Anderson Vista Vision machine, um, and um, I've, I've read something about the dice. Uh, is it the Dystra Flex platform or something? The, 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 yeah. the, the the movement of the uh, the the camera is on a sort of a, a platform. Is that right? Yeah, and I'm not going to do it justice because uh, I wasn't involved, obviously, in the development of that, and that was on stage. But it was uh, a, a camera hanging on the end of a crane that, uh, that was on a, a track that was about I want to say it was about a hundred feet long, and so they could move the camera through space uh, and uh, fly it around the miniature to make it give the illusion that it was actually the miniature that was flying around and not the camera. Uh, and uh, that was a, an important piece of technology that uh, Dykstra developed uh, along with uh, Al Miller, who did all the uh, electronic, you know, because it was a it had to be able to play back. They, they had to be able to program the moves. They were not shooting in real time. They were shooting in, uh, you know, I don't know how many frames a second that thing could shoot. But if you actually saw a shot being done uh, on the Dykstra Flex, the camera is typically moving at a very slow rate. Uh, and then you get the shot back and it would be greatly, you know, the ships would be flying by it very fast. So, uh yeah, that was uh, and uh, that you know that technology was expanded, and uh, a lot of people made similar kinds of uh, devices, uh, you know, motion control devices uh, for uh, applications throughout the special effects industry, and I think they still do it. Uh, yeah, I had 
I had lunch with uh, John Knoll. Have you ever heard of John Knoll? He's the uh, head technology effects supervisor at ILM now, brilliant guy. And uh, he uh, he was filming some stuff for The Mandalorian uh, right, okay. and doing it uh, old school motion control. Uh, so, but not filming on film, filming on a digital camera. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. If something if something's worked so well, then even with technology moving on, if you want to create a certain effect that maybe harks back to something as well, it's a good thing to use. And you know, even yeah. though we're shooting on digital now, using a similar core behind the effect um, yeah. you know, does create a similar similar end product. That's cool. I like that. Sorry, Adam. So you? No, no, it's okay. You? Uh, I think you worked on the LS printer, which is named after John Ellis. Is, is yes. Right. Um, what was it? What was it like originally? I think um, you you start out in Van Nuys in a, in a warehouse, didn't you? And that's why that's why apparently it was called Industrial Light and Magic. That he said that you know you you were in this industrial unit. Um, what was it like working out in uh, Van Nuys back in uh, before you moved to Marin County? Well, uh, it was super exciting because it was uh, a big job. I mean, my first big job in the film business. Uh, and, uh, and it was the same, there was a buzz around the whole building because most of the people, like 90% or more, this was our first film. None of us were in the union, uh, you know, and of course, George Lucas was pretty famous by that time because he came out of film school, uh, and had done American graffiti and, and a, a more obscure science fiction film before that called THX 1138. I, I was familiar with both films. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, reading an article in Time Magazine uh, about a year, since sometime in 1975, it was just a little article about how science fiction was making a comeback. And they mentioned uh, Star Wars being made by George Lucas, the filmmaker behind American Graffiti, and uh, he described it as a spaghetti western in outer space, and I immediately got really buzzed about that. That was really exciting, and uh, and to have an opportunity to work on it, because uh, I had some friends who just uh, had had gotten jobs on it, uh, was just like a dream come true for me. Because uh, at that time, uh, I big effects films were not being made. You know, since two thousand and one. Uh, that wasn't the trend in the film industry. What, what I was interested in is, um, you know, the sort of different departments that seem to be working in the same place because um, nowadays they seem to be quite separated and, you know, very far away. Obviously, the film unit will be different if they're shooting in Elstree uh, in, in England. But, you know, were you interacting with the art department or were you very much focused on your own thing? Well, given my lowly position... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't involved with the art department. Uh, I was right next door to the art department. I used to go through there all the time and look at what Joe had done. The first Star Wars, it was Joe Johnson. It was a fun place to hang out. And, uh, yeah. uh, but it, it was, yeah, it was a, a very family situation. And the, the first uh, uh, Van Nuys facility, when I first started working there, uh, there was only... I think about 30, 30 or 40 people at the most. Uh, so you knew everybody pretty pretty well. You knew everybody by name. Yeah. Everybody had a key to the facility, could work anytime you wanted. Uh, and uh, it was very loose. You know, we weren't, uh, we were throwing our trash in the garbage. I, I say that because I'm, when we got up to, doing Empire Strikes Back, and we had to be very careful about throwing anything in the trash because they found out that fans were going through the trash and pulling stuff out to sell or, or disclose to the public. Uh, and uh, so um, it was great. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had, uh, I, I remember you could bring friends through the facility uh, and everybody was like, I think Dykstra, I think the first couple of months I worked there, you know, he turned 30 years old. So he was, he was older, but I was 25. And so, but I, everybody was like in their twenties or thirties. Uh, 
I remember uh, Doug Trumbull's dad worked there, and you know he was like a grandpa to everybody. Uh, uh, Don Trumbull, he was great, and uh, but uh, yeah, it was kind of a, a unique experience for all of us. So yeah, we all we all were really raw and green, but uh, we were allowed to make mistakes because we made a lot of mistakes along the way, and uh, somehow it managed to all come together. And uh, it was pretty miraculous. I, I know you say sort of green and raw, but how does somebody find their way into optical printing in their 20s in San Francisco? Yeah. In well, the 70s? <laughs> that's an interesting question. And uh, I went to uh, CalArts, uh, which was a, a, at that time, it was a brand new school that was uh, founded kind of through the Dis Walt Disney, uh, he had a dream to start an art school. And it came to fruition around 1970. They built a campus out in Valencia, California, which is just north, well, it's just north of Los Angeles. And uh, I, at the time I was going to a small college in Ohio and the only thing I was interested in was film and photography. Uh, so uh, I had a, film teacher who was very influential in my life, uh, who recommended I apply to CalArts, uh, UCLA, USC, or New York University. At the time, those were the big film schools. And CalArts was a new school. And uh, I didn't have the greatest grades. And I wasn't interested in going to New York City. Uh, I couldn't get into USC or UCLA. And CalArts at that time, their main requirement for getting in there was if you could pay the tuition. And uh, my dad could pay the tuition. It was like $3,000 a year. So uh, I went to CalArts. And uh, they happened to have an Oxbury animation stand and an optical printer that had been donated to the school. I don't know where they came from. And uh, they had uh, a great uh, experimental uh, underground filmmaker. I don't know if you're familiar with the, there was a tradition in the 1960s and 70s of uh, underground films. There were film festivals all around. And uh, they had this guy, Pat O'Neill, who later became a mentor to me, uh, who's uh, still around making films. And he taught the optical printer. And his films were very dependent on the uh, you know, using the optical printer to create abstract effects. And so I, I immediately gravitated towards that that style of filming. I wasn't really an animator, so to speak, but uh, I loved film graphics a lot. And uh, so uh, I had rudimentary experience on an optical printer. Uh, and also uh, Robbie Blalack was a, a student of, uh, Robbie Blalack was the optical supervisor on uh, the first Star Wars. And, you know, could Star Wars or uh, Cal Arts at that time was very small. So you knew everybody in the film school. And uh, I knew Rob Blalack. And uh, he uh, uh, got a old op optical printer that was donated to Cal Arts, not the the one I was mentioning at first, but another one that they couldn't use because it was too uh, cumbersome and it wasn't modified for 16 millimeter. And he convinced CalArts in the per to selling that optical printer to him and he started a business called Practice Thumbworks. And uh, he later, he had a connection with uh, Dykstra. I, I, I don't want to speak for Robbie, uh, but he, uh, so he was one of the first people hired by Dykstra to set up because they knew Dykstra knew at that time that their process that they were developing to do the composites for Star Wars would be heavily dependent upon the, the optical process, utilizing optical printers. And so I had that connection. Uh, I knew Robbie, you know, was on Star Wars. And then there was another close friend of mine, Adam Beckett, who was a brilliant animator and also a great optical printer guy, although he didn't work on opticals in Star Wars. And uh, he was hired to do the animation effects. And uh, I used to see him frequently. We lived near near each other. Uh, and 
And so I, when I found out he was working on Star Wars, I just said, hey, they got any job openings there, I'd love to work on <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so when he uh, needed help, uh, he uh, had me come in and interview with Dykstra and uh, I got hired and, uh, and uh, I at first started my career working uh, in uh, the uh, rotoscope animation slash rotoscope department. And I was also so, tasked to set up uh, a film processing uh, unit uh, for use by the stage. It, it was a, a microfilm processor. Yeah. I remember uh, I read the script, uh, you know, which was just laying around there, which wasn't the case during Empire Jedi. It was <laughs> you, nobody could read the script of those, and uh, uh, it, it, it was corny, but it was compelling. And uh, Luke Skywalker in the script, his name was Luke Starkiller. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, that, I, that got changed before they started shooting. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the film was always called Star Wars. Uh, and exactly. the, it, there was no mention of it being chapter, you know, A New Hope or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how much of that was, uh, uh, you know, the idea that it would become three films. I, you know, and Lucas always says he had written it for nine film uh the, the whole saga and I, I i don't know how much of that he had in his mind i remember when we were making star wars in the end of the film during the battle in the trench on the death star uh han solo comes down and rescues luke and uh and han solo's ship goes spinning off or not han solo darth vader's ship goes spinning okay. off into space yeah. and uh that was the end of darth vader and then uh, at some point, uh, just a few weeks before we were finished, uh, they said, no, uh, they cut in a couple of shots of the, the ship stopping its spin, which they created from the original element of its spinning. And then they had a shot of Darth Vader regaining control of the ship. So yeah. you knew coming out of the film that he was still alive. And I always thought that that was tacked on uh, so that they could keep him as a character yeah. in the sequel. Now that's just that—that that was the impression I had working on Star Wars. But uh, uh, I don't know how much of it uh, Lucas had uh, really plotted out. I was going to say, uh, Lucas, a lot of people believe he had it all plotted out, wouldn't he? He's—he's uh, he's had it all. He had the whole story, the preceding three, even before he started with Star Wars. Yeah, uh, but that, again, that's my opinion as well. That's all unfounded i guess but uh yeah that's, I, thank god he started with episode four if he had started with episode <laughs> one there might never have been another star wars again yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i just uh had a hard time with the prequels yes well so I, did we. I, I i was going to move on to that we might as well talk about that now um one thing um lloyd and i uh, especially and, and dave um have talked about many times before is if you want to call them old special effects rather than modern special effects, I don't know. I think it's probably unfair to call them old, um, but non-digital model, modern special effects. Um, there's a grittiness to them. There's a kind of realism to them. Uh, and we do feel that modern CGI, it doesn't, maybe it will when it develops even further, but it it's too shiny. It's too clean. It's too perfect. And I think what you and, 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 and the guys you were working with seem to do is, they, they created and you created something that was really realistic and, and they could buy into. Um, one of the, uh, the best examples I can think of just with Star Wars is um, you think about um, the scene that they added into um, episode four, um, Lloyd's favorite scene, <laughs> where um, Jabba the Hutt is... Um, standing under the the uh the millennium falcon and he's completely cgi now i can't stand that but you see him in the model format in return of the jedi and that's to me that's much more believable so yeah. do, you, do you feel that there's things that are lost in that sort of modern transition yeah uh i think uh one of the uh 
issues I have, it's not so much the CG, it's just they put so much stuff into the shots. Uh, at uh, Like I think it was episode two where it starts off with this spectacular space battle that's just so incredibly dense with uh, intricate camera moves and, and like thousands of objects flying around. Uh, I, I, uh, Phil Tippett, who worked on the Star Wars films, uh, it said to me once, uh, you know, you see these films today and it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. Uh, it's just like you're just uh, assaulted by so much stuff that it kind of loses its impact. Uh, so uh, I miss the elegance of just a few things going on. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I love the digital effects when they're done well. Uh, you know, like something like uh, the bear and the revenant uh, is just brilliant. Uh, uh, and it has a lot to do with the story too, if you can uh, get into the story. But yeah, yeah, I, I did not like the Java, <laughs> the animated Java the Hut. Like I, I know, like I remember seeing, uh, I, I think at some point when we were working on Star Wars, you know, that was in the script where he meets Jabba out by the Millennium Falcon before it takes on and they actually filmed the scene with uh, Han Solo and there's, a, there's an actor Dressed up in a costume to, to play in Java, you know, at that time, you know, so I, and he wasn't wearing one of those uh, motion capture suits. So it was, yeah. you know, I think that there was their intention that Java was a, uh, a human like character with the costume on. And then, uh, but since they cut him out of the film altogether, when they got around to actually showing Jabba and uh, Return of the Jedi, then he could let his imagination run wild. Yeah. But it's it's interesting you talk about simplicity of shot. I think um, I was reading only a couple of days ago the the opening sequence of Star Wars where you, you're approaching the the ship or the ship supposed to be flying over the camera. Um, apparently, that was shot a number of times with um, with with you know screen tests with viewers to get the right sort of feeling of apprehension i don't know if that's true but it's that what what seems to come out was the fact that th there was a real painstaking um precision there about trying to get the pacing of the shot right to create that suspense so the complete opposite of what you're saying happened in attack of the clones that this was just the 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 imposing figure of of the 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 starship and then, and then the, the smaller ship being sort of brought into it. Um, so it, it seems that those things that you were involved in were, you know, there was a lot of time spent on trying to keep it as clean and as crisp and as, as sort of slow paced in many ways uh, as, uh, uh, as you'd want to create that suspense. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you they didn't do any screen tests for that opening shot. They were just wow. desperate to get it done. So that was probably the, <laughs> first, the second take they did, and they went with it. Wow. Richard Edlin shot that. Uh, it's pretty amazing because that model is only about three feet long, I think. Uh, and the detail that the model guys put on it was uh, very convincing. Dave, what was your favorite part that you, well, your favorite effect, something you worked on that you're kind of either enjoyed doing the most for if we're still talking about Star Wars in the Star Wars movie, then and maybe the bit you're most proud of that looked the best or that you didn't think was going to quite work and it did work. Have you got any moments well, like that? Well, uh, from an optical perspective, uh, I you know, I didn't design any of the shots, uh. So uh, I, I like the final battle scene, particularly once they get down in the trench. Uh, you know, I'm really happy with the way a lot of those shots came out. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, if you ask me my favorite scene in uh, Star Wars, it's a scene I didn't work on, which I wish I had worked on. Uh, and that's the, the twin sunset, uh, the twin suns setting on Tatooine and Luke going out looking wistfully at the sunset, realizing he's going to be trapped on this desert planet for the rest of his life. And the, the great John Williams music, 
Uh, and I just, uh, I love that scene from the very first time I saw the film. And, uh, I, and I was like, when I saw the last Star Wars, uh, maybe I liked it so much because they go back to that scene in the very end of the last Star yeah. Wars. I was going, yeah. oh, this is, so it, it erased all the bitter taste of uh, the prequels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really done. I've only seen the prequels once, but uh, I just, uh, I don't know if you ever heard Patton Oswalt does a bit on uh, on uh, George Lucas and the prequels in one of his comedy records. And uh, he just meets uh, George Lucas on the street and he's talking about the prequels. And, and uh, yeah, he says, yeah, you want, you like Darth Vader? Well, now you get to see him as a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, you gotta listen to the Pat Oswald bit. <laughs> Obviously, we know we know how big an impact Star Wars had and and has on on on, on everybody. You know, we in earlier shows we talk about how I think both Lloyd Knight and might uh, Return the Jedi might have been the first film we saw in the cinema. Um, E.T. that you also worked on, um, I think, was the first film that we remember crying to when we were kids. Um, was there a point when you were working on Star Wars that you knew just how big it was going to be? Did you kind of have the buzz around set that you knew it was going to take off and be such a big hit? Well, uh, I, you know, you know, we were seeing footage. Uh, I remember the first footage we saw uh, in color that they sent back for us to look at was uh, stuff they'd shot in uh, Tunisia, you know, uh, C-3PO out in the desert uh, and, uh, you know, some other scenes. And I was just taken by how great it looked. And uh, I just had this tremendous fear, like, well, the special effects aren't going to live up to the great art direction and photography and everything else. Uh, and so that was a fear of mine. Because, you know, when you're working on something like that, you, you can't, it's impossible to step back from it and get distance from it and really appreciate it. A lot of times, even in my own little films, uh, I, I can't really see what I'm doing until if I look at the film 10 years later. Uh, so, you know, that was a concern of mine was, gee, uh, I, it's going to be a disappointment if the effects don't live up to the all the other great stuff that they're doing for the film. Uh, now, that said, uh, towards the end of the film, I was talking to uh, either Lauren Peterson or uh, Stuart Ziff, uh, who were, you know, on the film. And they were talking like Stuart Ziff had gone out and bought a bunch of 20th Century Fox stock. And I'm going, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the logic was uh, Jaws, when Jaws came out, that was one of the first big mega blockbuster summer films. Jaws had only come out a few years before that. And uh, at the time, <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, Jaws, uh, it was a universal film, and universal stock was selling at $8 a share before Jaws came out. And then not that long after Jaws turned into this huge blockbuster, Universal stock went up to $80 a share. And uh, so they were saying, yeah, you know, 20th Century Fox stock is only $10 a share. And uh, I'm putting all my money into 20th Century Fox stock. So I wasn't married. I didn't, you know, I was making more money than I could spend. <laughs> so I put $1,000 into uh, all my savings at that time from working on the film into uh, 20th Century Fox stock. And uh, sure enough, within uh, six weeks after the film came out, it went up to about $24 a share. <laughs> I didn't hang on for it long enough, but uh, so I must've right. had some subconscious thought that uh, it was gonna be a big hit. I, nothing could have predicted on the epic scale, uh, you know, that the, the the, the magnitude of that. So so tell me, Dave, um, you, you're in the, the, the original warehouse, you, you're working hard. There's, there's stories about 80-hour um, weeks, um, burned coffee smell, 
mouse and flea infestations, lumber burgers at the fast food place. Um, are all of these things true? Is that would that describe your sort of day to day <laughs> life? Yes. <laughs> The uh, rotoscope department was right over the coffee machine, and uh, we would work late every night uh, because uh, the uh, cutoff at the film lab was one in the morning. So you had to get the uh, film you were shooting to the lab in Hollywood by one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and so we frequently worked late, and then one of us uh, in animation uh, would run the film down to the lab on the way home. And uh, and invariably, uh, somebody would leave a coffee pot on the coffee machine with the burner on, and it would all burn off, and then we'd get that smell of burnt coffee every night. Uh, so that's a very distinct memory for me. And then later on, when I was working in the optical department, I also delivered the film to, uh, uh, we uh, used the lab, uh, in, uh, MGM lab, for all the optical stuff and it was right on my way home. So I was tasked with delivering all the uh, unprocessed opticals to uh, MGM. Of course, they don't do that anymore. They have uh, other people that do that sort of thing, but uh, you, you had to do everything when you were working on those films back then. I collect film posters from the fifties. Oh. oh, awesome. Wow. Lloyd, you're going to be very impressed. Lloyd's, Lloyd's yeah. a real poster poster geek. Yeah, I'm kind of more, um, I'm a bit more modern day. I, I kind of start with my oldest sort of posters that I like. Uh, well, not that I like that, I've, I've got, but prints of a sort of Drew Struzan. So you go, you know, we're going back to late 70s, early 80s for mine. And then. Okay, I think that's true of every collector because all, all the posters I collect are from my childhood. Right, cool. Yeah. This was a dinosaur movie from the uh, 1950s that I remember seeing in a reissue around 1963 or four. It's a guy in a dinosaur suit. <laughs> and uh, it's an that's awesome amazing. film. <laughs> oh, that's wicked. Yeah. That's um, th this one here. This is, um, this is a modern um, guy who's, who does a lot of, um, he'll redo movie posters or they'll use him for, well, for example, this was Empire Strikes Back when it went into cinemas in the UK for the 40th anniversary, and he was yeah. commissioned to do the Empire Strikes Back poster for it. So he did a standard one, and this is like this is the Japanese variant he did. So oh, he, nice. he pulled this from the this is from the original sort of Japanese poster he pulled all the text from. Um, yeah, that's a guy called Matt Ferguson, so I like his stuff as well. But Drew Drew Struzan is is really the one that I found my love of movie posters through. Oh yeah, and as yeah. you said, from my childhood, you got you know the Star Wars, you got um. The indie, you know, the Raiders of Lost Ark, and all, all those type ones. So, is it? Oh, have you seen any yeah. of those ones? I haven't seen e any of those. So, so there's ET. Yeah, ET. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a good yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm familiar with his work, uh, and uh, I know he did some uh, posters. Like I, I think he did. Uh, I want to say Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a full size poster. Wars. That, yeah, so uh, Star Wars and New Hope, um, uh, a lot of them, and then sort of going into the eighties, things like I don't know, Adventures in Babysitting, and yeah. Batteries Not Included, as we saw one, there actually. as well. Yeah, you can see that he's done a montage of some of the ones yeah, he's done. A montage, there. yeah, and that's George Lucas. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, Lucas uh, has probably one of the most extensive movie poster collections in the world. Uh, you know, really? he buys stuff at auction and he's got really big stuff too six sheets, posters to cover like a two story wall. And uh, he's got uh, all these posters all over the ILM facility in the Presidio. I don't wow. know if he's going to have those in his museum in Los Angeles, but uh, I, I used to uh, go to a framer uh, in uh, near where I lived in Marin County. Uh, I collect this size lobby cards, which are 11 by 14. Uh, and this guy who uh, I would take to get the posters framed uh, did all of Lucas's framing. That was like oh. more than 50% of his business. So he would always have a big collection of Lucas posters in his shop whenever I'd go in there. So it was nice to see. Oh, fantastic. I bet, I bet Joe, uh, 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 Drew Struzan emailed me once. I, I emailed his sort of um, 
his email address for the store where a lot of his stuff was getting sold, the prints and things. And, and it was him that emailed me back, which was quite yeah. cool. And it, he, I was kind of asking for advice, you know, where do I start? And, and he came back and he just said, look, you know, follow your heart, um, you know, buy what you want to look at. And uh, he also said he doesn't keep any of his work. So I imagine that Lucas has a lot of Drew Struzan's originals, which which I would love to, to get one day. Yeah. Um, so I imagine he's got a lot of those. They'll be fantastic. The original paintings in there. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it's a fun uh, hobby, uh, but uh, yeah, again, I I don't think I have any posters after 1970. Uh, oh, right. It's weird. They used to give us posters of all the uh, the films we worked on. They they bring in a stack of uh, unfolded one sheets, and I gave all those away over the years because they just weren't uh, the the kind. They weren't the the genre yeah. as I collected. Now I regret yeah, all those. But one sheets yeah. are a lot harder to store. Yeah, definitely. This this is a twenty four by thirty six. That's kind of the size I I use. And I've got a nice. I've got a portfolio where I can keep them flat until I can get them in the frames as well. Um, yeah. Kind of size I go for. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I had a uh, uh, a poster uh, from the original Ten Commandments or the nineteen fifty six version that uh it's got a real dramatic painting of the party in the red sea on it it's a not not a real valuable one sheet but i had that in my collection and when i was working uh at ilm in san rafael i just tacked it up on the wall behind the anderson printer which was worked on did the opticals for that yeah. film in 1996 yeah. yeah and then uh when i left uh, lucasfilm i just left the poster there and somebody framed it and they kept it there over the years. And then uh, at some point, uh, Lucas uh, closed down the shop in San Rafael and he moved into that new facility in the Presidio and they took that poster and the optical printer had been retired by that point. So they set it up as kind of a, mu a museum display in one of the stairwells with that poster on the wall behind it. And yeah. somebody over the years had written my name on the back of the poster that it was my property. So I got a call from uh, George Lucas's personal assistant asking me about the poster, and I said, well, "George can just have that uh, for his collection. Uh, you know, it's not worth a lot, but I'd be honored if he kept it." And then, uh, and I about a week later, I got a nice little note from uh, George Lucas, which I have somewhere. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So fellow collector. Yeah. Well, that's good. If I ever meet George, I've got like a, I've got an in. I've got a, we've got something in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wicked, wicked. Right. So, um, obviously, we've talked a lot about, uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps Star Wars and and George Lucas, but you you've been involved in quite a lot of other films as well. Um, Close Encounters, Battlestar Galactica, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, E.T. Um, I think Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan is cited on your um, filmography as well. Are there any of the, the those sorts of films? And I'll come to Cocoon at the end um, for, for possibly an obvious reason, but are there any of those films, Temple of the Doom, Temple of Doom, Never Ending Story, is there something that you feel proud of of, of those films or, or a number of those films that you, you think deserves an honorary mention? Uh, well, uh, you know, I really, of all the Star Wars films, The Empire Strikes Back is generally between the crew, the, the original crew who worked on uh, uh, the, A New Hope and, and Return of the Jedi. Uh, we all favor The Empire Strikes Back, that there was a real buzz about working on that film. We were all <laughs> happy about that. <laughs> and most of us were somewhat disappointed in the, uh, you know, the direction he took with Return of the Jedi. Uh, I, I don't want to, and I don't want to come off as criticizing George Lucas because I love George Lucas. I mean, you know, he he's a brilliant guy and uh, we I'm lucky to have been able to work on these films and it was a, uh, you know, life-changing decision to work on these films. Uh, but... Uh, so, uh, you know, both the experience of A New Hope and uh, Empire Strikes Back. And The Empire Strikes Back was interesting in the respect that uh, uh, we had access to Lucas almost every day. 
uh, and, and not unlike what I envisioned Stanley Kubrick on 2001, uh, Lucas came to dailies every day and would hang out uh, and uh, he would make all those decisions like, yes, no, I don't want you to do this. I want you to do this. I mean, you had uh, this immediate feedback from him, which we did not have on A New Hope. Uh, I think Lucas came through the ILM facility once or twice. He was, uh, and he edited the film in uh, Northern California. So we, uh, we didn't have that connection. And so there was a lot of, uh, uh, miscommunication, I guess, that would happen naturally. Because Lucas is a very technically minded filmmaker like Spielberg. And uh, and since he was editing the film and coming in every day, he knew what was going on in the edit. He could make these simple decisions that really propelled the uh, process on uh, very well. So th that was a, a real privilege, having him there uh, overseeing the effects on... Uh, the Empire Strikes Back. I think he, uh, he'd realised that from a, a New Hope, hadn't he? Because he'd he'd pushed himself with too many roles. So an Empire by delegating and then focusing on his his love, his technical elements, and it being the editor now. Uh, well, just the yeah. editor taking away the other the other element to it. Obviously, yes. Yeah, so you, you got more of him because he was he had more time as well, didn't he? On the back of that. Yeah, and I think uh, he was like be... himself to be an editor at heart. Uh, yeah, that's how he his start. Who did he bring in to direct? Was it um, who directed Empire? Who did he bring in then? Oh, Irvin, uh, Irvin, Irvin Kirshner. Kirshner. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. who uh, I thought did a great job. I mean, he was really good at handling the actors. Uh, I'd never met him, uh, and uh, I, you know, how much input he had in terms of uh, where the camera was going to go or how much freedom he had, I don't necessarily know. I know that there was a bit of a battle in the editing of the film, which uh, I don't know enough about to articulate. Uh, but yeah, the, the, a lot of people contributed to the outcome of that. Uh, and and uh, I will also, I want to mention uh, the cinematographer on Empire Strikes Back was this guy, Peter Shushitsky. Uh, and, uh, and I, we all think, I think it's by far the best photographed uh, of the three, the first three Star Wars. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, um, the, the Hoth scene at the start is, is such a good opening to, to a film yeah. that, you know, you've cut from all of the, the, the sort of space work in, in uh, the end of, of Star Wars, uh, A New Hope, um, as it became to be. And then you've cut to this this ice planet, and um, you know I, I think there was some special effects wizardry in relation to the tauntauns as well, um, and, and that whole atmosphere that's built up is just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. So do you, yeah. do you, do you, do you find that um, because of that that iconic work that you've done um, that some of the other films, as amazing as they are, you know, ET broke loads of records and um, was one of the most successful films of its time. Um, Close Encounters as well won, won a number of accolades. Do you find that they sort of pale into insignificance compared to the, the Star Wars films or do they hold a different place in your heart? Uh, well, uh, I was privileged to work on all of them. Uh, Close Encounters uh, was happened right after Star Wars. Uh, I... Uh, I only worked on that for two or three months and uh, somebody, a couple of people from star Wars, including, yeah, <laughs> including Dennis Marin uh, went over and uh, did all the mothership photography. Uh, and uh, so I, I got asked to uh, be a, a night shift camera operator on the, the 65 millimeter Oxbury camera. Uh, and the animation supervisor was this guy, Bob Swarth, a real talented animator. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I didn't work on any fancy things. They had a different pipeline for producing composites, which was interesting. Uh, it, uh, 
you know, it was it involved, uh, you know, I shot a lot of star fields uh, on uh, Close Encounters, and uh, those were shot uh, on the Oxbury Animation Stand. And uh, they, if, uh, if they were composited with other elements, uh, they would uh, shoot the, this, the alien spacecraft in optical. They would put it down, lay it down on the, uh, on the negative and not process it. And then they would send the negative over uh, to the animation department and uh, we would load it into the camera, uh, the unprocessed negative. And if we needed a mat, we'd put a mat in there. Then we would shoot the stars directly onto the uh, the effects stock, which is very slow stock. So we would have to shoot uh, minute long exposures on the animation camera to do the star field. So th that was a fun experience. I mean, I really uh, it was uh, it was fun because Dennis and Scott Squires were in the the uh, room right next door to animation, uh, shooting the mothership. And so I got to go over and see what they were doing all the time. And, uh, you know, they were filming the mothership in a smoke chamber, which is kind of interesting. So, and the other thing, nice thing about Close Encounters was uh, the facility, uh, Future General Corporation, Doug Trumple's company was only about five minutes from where I lived. I lived in Venice Beach at the time. So I, I really dug that, that I only had to drive five minutes to get to work. <laughs> That we're about a half an hour to get to uh, Van Nuys. That's always a bonus. How f how far was um how far was your job for Battlestar Galactica then following Close Encounters? Uh, that was about half an hour, forty minutes. And that's that not too when, bad. Uh, Battlestar Galactica was filmed in uh, the original ILM facility. Uh, you know, it had a similar pipeline. The, how they produce the effects it was just uh, using the Dijkstra flex and uh, you know that wasn't done in, uh, an, in an anamorphic format uh, that was done in uh, regular 35 millimeter film so uh, it, you know we had a different optical printer and then we had uh, modified the Anderson printer taken off the VistaVision camera and put on a uh, a, a regular 35 millimeter camera well the if you see the uh, video uh, in my home movie that's on uh, 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 Vimeo of working the, the uh, home movie footage, in the end, I I'm working on an optical printer that is the Anderson printer. And yeah. actually, that was I was working on Galactica, not Star Wars. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would notice that it's a different camera. <laughs> it would take a really trained eye to pick that up. Yeah. That's a little secret. Were they I'm, after I'm, the um, about Star Galactica? Were they after a similar team? Did they want a similar, uh, not just the similar effects? Were they after the sort of similar result? Uh, did they want big things? Did he did he sort of um, did they did he look to employ a lot of the similar people who'd been working on Star Wars because Galactica kind of followed a similar thread? Yeah, uh, I wasn't in on the beginning of Galactica because I was in India for a few months. I'd had a big trip planned. So when I came back to Galactica, they'd already been shooting for a few months at least. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of, uh, you know, they had a lot of the same crew that was Dykstra's, you know, company and Joe Johnston was still there. And, uh, you know, the M Lauren Peterson and Dennis and Richard Edlin. And uh, it, it, took so much effort to get the Dijkstra Flex set up to do Star Wars. The camera people barely had time to learn how to operate it. And then they had just three or four months left to shoot all the miniature elements. Whereas when Galactica started, they had the process all worked out. Uh, and yeah. so they were able to really uh, open up the, uh, they'd learned a lot and they were able to apply what they'd learned on Star Wars. So it was, uh, you know, they had a lot more, uh, freedom i guess so to speak so that was a good experience uh working on i worked on galactica for about uh just about eight months and then at some point while i was working on galactica uh you know key people uh had been approached by uh lucas and gary kurtz about uh coming up to san rafael and uh 
working on uh, the sequel to Star Wars. Uh, I, I was not asked at that time, uh, you know, at that time, you know, that by the time I started working there, they'd already asked Dennis and Bruce and Richard Edlund was part of that, Lauren Peterson, Steve Golly, uh, obviously Joe Johnson. He was probably the number one guy, probably the first guy to go up there. I was hoping that we could um, fast forward to uh, to 1984, 85 to um, Cocoon. Um, yes. Yeah. The, the sci-fi comedy drama, I think it's described as. Um, I, I remember I remember watching uh, Cocoon growing up um, and being being sort of touched by the the, the way in which uh, a sci-fi was uh, sci-fi film was looking at relationships and age and and, and longevity and, and things like that. Um, I don't think I'd realised that it had won an Oscar for um, visual effects. Um, what, what was what was what I was interested in is um, I know it was directed by Ron Howard, but um, it, it said that perhaps Robert Zemeckis was involved originally as the director for nearly twelve months, or working on it from a, from its infancy for about twelve months. I just wondered whether you were aware of that in your role, or whether those that those decisions had changed or been made prior to your involvement, or did you see a change in direction? Yeah. Uh, no, I did not. When I worked on the film, when I started working on the film, at that time, Ron Howard was the director. I, I had heard that Zemeckis was originally, that, that uh, Richard Zanuck and his uh, his, his wife, uh, yeah. uh, I can't remember her name. Is it Lily? Lily? Is it Lily? Yeah. 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 Uh, were the producers, and they originally wanted Robert Zemeckis. This is what I heard to direct the film and uh, and 20th Century, I think it was 20th Century Fox. Not sure of the studio. I want to say, let's say it was Fox. They said, okay, what's he, what has Zemeckis done? And he said, well, he's just finishing this film called Romancing the Stone, just Romancing the Stone. Yeah. And they said, well, can we see that? And he said, well, it's not finished. You can see the cut that we have yeah. that we're working on. And I, from what I understand, they showed the cut of Romancing the Stone to the executives and they didn't like it, <laughs> which is crazy <laughs> because it became one of the biggest hit films of the year. Yeah. And that they, yeah. that prompted them to say, get somebody else. Now, I, that may be a different story behind that, yeah. but, uh, but I, I, I love Zemeckis, uh, yeah. but I, I think Ron Howard was a great choice for Cocoon and, uh, I, you know, I did not work directly with Ron Howard. I met him a couple of times. He's a fantastic person, uh, really? really genuine, humble, sincere guy, very great director. Uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, it, it was by today's standards, it's inconceivable that a film like Cocoon would even be nominated for an Academy Award much less win an Academy Award because it was not a big job. There was probably fewer than a hundred effect shots and they right. obviously weren't these uh, big uh, spectacular outer space in your face kind of shots. It was more subtle, I guess. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And the other two films that were nominated and the films that I, I went to the bake off that year where the Academy looks at all the films in yeah. consideration for special effects. And I think a lot of the Academy members were older and they were just tired yeah. of all the films. They were looking that all the effects were blood and gore, uh, yeah. gunfights, explosions. And uh, somehow they connected with this film that was more human and didn't have a bunch of people getting killed with big spectacular explosions and car chases. So it got nominated and it won. So there well, you congratulations. Go. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, what, what, one thing, oh, are we going to see something important? Hey, hey. look at that. I don't it show it off too much. <laughs> and that is an Oscar. Wow. Well, we, it. It. In it's presence heavy. of greatness. Is it? <laughs> I was I was interested, Dave. Um, you say about the the other films that were nominated. I, I wondered if there was a sort of a friendly um, competitive edge because wasn't it um, Young Sherlock Holmes? Wasn't Dennis Murin and John Ellis involved in yeah. Young Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. Young Sherlock Holmes was nominated. 
uh, and uh, uh, Return to Oz. Uh, and I thought both of them had as good or way better effects in Cocoon. So, uh, but again, you know, it's a lot of times it's about politics and, you know, how the Academy, well, just look at their track record of picking best picture winners. Uh, yeah. you know, I, but look at it right. <laughs> yeah, if you look back at all the best picture winners, they're a lot of times forgettable films. Like one of my big beefs is my, probably my favorite film of all time is 2001, A Space Odyssey. And, do you know what the best picture winner was that year? A, a really forgettable musical called Oliver, based on all of the plays. Nothing against that film, but who who watches that yeah. film today? Well, it's a it's two thousand and one. The you know one of the greatest groundbreaking films in in many different genres and special effects and the like. Um, it's almost inconceivable that that didn't win. Um, yeah. there, there seems to be a, there seems to be a, a, an accepted thing uh, in terms of acceptance speeches. You always thank the academy. Um, you're always supposed to thank various different people. I think um, you um, you thanked your mum and dad amongst others, um, which the they were the, very the, happy about that. Yeah, the audience oh. appreciated that a lot. I, I, I noticed as well. Um, you, you thanked your um, your wife and your two boys. I think. Um, you also gave um you gave a particular thank to ILM's general manager Warren Franklin, and I just wondered was there a special reason for that? Uh, well, I just remembered, uh, you know, first off, you realize this is going to be the only time in your life you're going to be in front of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> you only get to do this once, uh, and uh, so I I try I I just remembered like on. Uh, uh, I think on ET, I was ET, uh, the optical supervisor was a good friend who worked in the optical department, Ken Smith, a brilliant uh, mm -hmm. optical guy. And uh, he thanked me at the at speech he gave uh, at the uh, Oscars. And I was just like really touched. That really meant a lot. And uh, I remember I got like mail and phone calls from people I had not heard from in years just saying, hey, I heard your name mentioned on the Academy Awards. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to give credit. I also thanked, you know, a number of people in the optical department who, yeah. you know, I didn't do it all by myself. People who uh, did a lot of the work on it. And uh, at the time, Warren Franklin was, uh, he was uh, actually used to work in optical, then he, uh, moved out of optical to run the entire ILM facility. So I wanted right. to make sure I thanked him. He, he's a good friend, and <laughs> great guy. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, the Academy has a luncheon uh, for all the nominees a couple of weeks before the actual award ceremony. And uh, they, uh, they tell you at that luncheon in a good hearted way uh, to shut the F up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, keep your yeah. as short as possible and if there's four of you just get one of you to talk uh and obviously uh you know that didn't happen. <laughs> they don't want to hear the effects technicians rambling <laughs> on about thanking everybody you know they want to hear the actors and directors and the, the glamour people but uh so anyhow, everybody ignores that. We all talked, and uh, and uh, I got it all in. And then I found out, like in subsequent years, uh, friends from ILM would get nominated. You know, ILM won a number of Academy Awards, yeah. and I was told that uh, uh, that uh, the Academy at the luncheon would run a, a videotape of past Academy Award speeches to give them a, a, an example of what not to do. <laughs> I, I did, there was a clip of me in there rambling Brilliant. on. Brilliant. <laughs> I like it. Lasting legacy. Yeah. yeah. I think um, you weren't the only person from uh, to, to be involved in Cocoon that won an Oscar, because didn't Don Amici win a, a Best Supporting Actor yeah, Oscar Don as well? Yeah, won uh, Best Supporting Actor. And I, obviously... Uh, you know, I was not the supervisor. I was the optical supervisor. And Ken Ralston, the brilliant effects guy, 
uh, you know, I was the ILM supervisor of the effects and then uh, the great Scott Farrar, who uh, still, well, I, I don't think he's working at ILM now, but uh, had worked until a couple of years ago, was the effects cameraman. And then uh, I was uh, very honored that they nominated Ralph McQuarrie, uh, yeah. who uh, I always thought never got the recognition he deserved for Star Wars. At least uh, when it came time to at the Academy Awards, uh, I always thought they should have given Ralph McQuarrie a special award because he influenced uh, so much the look of the Star Wars universe at that time. And he was such a humble guy. But uh, so that that was uh, kind of a thrill to be with, uh, to have him included in that group. And uh, I, I should give mention to Phil Norwood, uh, who was the effects art director who gave up his position uh, to uh, to allow Ralph McQuarrie to get a nomination because he could only have up to four people nominated. Was there was there anything about the ceremony or the after show party that maybe <laughs> that you're allowed to tell us um, that that resonates with you that you remember as particularly funny or fun or interesting or was it quite a, a sort of relaxed it affair? Goes by uh, really quick. And uh, yeah, it was just, just a, a spectacular honor. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember at the luncheon before uh, they, they have arranged seating at the table. So, uh, and they set me at a table with uh, Carl Malden and his wife, who was a prominent member of the Academy. Uh, some guy who, uh, had a nomination from doing sound effects for Rambo and then uh, the actor Eric Roberts uh, and uh, yeah it was just it was it, and Eric Roberts was nominated for best supporting actor in a great film called Runaway Train and uh, he's an actor I admire he's a little hard to talk to <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> you know, but uh, and then Carl Malden was the nicest guy him and his wife were just the nicest people you could possibly imagine they were a delight to be with well um oh, and then uh, I, I i should mention uh at the luncheon i got to meet uh, robert wise who was uh the president of the academy and chat with him briefly uh coming in he was shaking everybody's hand as they came into the luncheon and i got to talk to him and express uh my love of uh, his uh, great uh, films, including The Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, oh, okay. West Side Story. And uh, of course, he was the editor on Citizen Kane. And, uh, and then uh, uh, one of his first films was a great horror film called The Body Snatcher, which is uh, oh, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite. Uh, well, I, th I was a big Boris Karloff fan, and I, I think I it's uh, one of his greatest roles. Yeah. Um, one thing Dave asked me, Dave, other Dave Berry asked me to do is um, to ask you if you, you you've heard about this. Um, we we looked and you can't get Cocoon on any digital platforms at the moment. You know all the the famous platforms, you know Amazon or or Netflix or the like. You can't get um, you can get the the sequel, but you can't get the the original. Um, so so I was so concerned that actually, and it's arrived today, which is quite funny. Um, I actually bought um, the Blu-ray for the 30th anniversary, which I've literally just opened in front of you. Um, but um, we just wondered if you knew um, if there was any particular reason why um, it might not be available, licensing issues or anything like that. They don't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't heard that. So I, I remember uh, it was on TV in the last year or so somewhere. Somebody yeah. mentioned that they saw it on TV. So... So what uh, parts of the, the film were you actually, would you say, I, you I would say that, the, that's what I was involved in? Yeah, the, uh, you know, there's about 100 optical shots in that film. And uh, the big uh, contribution, which was unusual in optical, is uh, we were tasked with creating that glowing, the glowing aliens. And, uh, and that was a process we actually developed in the optical department whereas in most uh, film you know most of the jobs in fact 99 percent of the jobs we did in optical the elements were all created 
by the stage or the matte painters or the animators, and then we would just composite them together. But we actually created the element of the glow around the uh, around the aliens and, uh, and cocoon. And so I, I I got to develop that look, and uh, and we actually did a test shot uh, at ILM with uh, somebody dressed up in a white leotard, uh, and, uh, and we did a scene where he's in the, the alien is in the room and we needed an actor. So Ron Howard is in it. I used to have a copy of that shot somewhere. I don't know where it is now. Uh, and, uh, there's just a scene where they're looking at each other in the, in the room together. Cool. Sorry, Lloyd. I think, I think Lloyd had actually, before you, before you, um, you joined the interview. He was talking to me about that, and uh, we were saying that the, the you know the glowing alien thing is one of the sort of things that you you really really think about when you think about that film. So, yeah, and the uh, the cosmic love scene in the swimming pool uh, that was all a creation of uh, optical with it and animation. So, uh, you know, I, I I confess I haven't actually seen the movie for probably twenty years. So, uh, I I. I would like to revisit it. So big question for you, Dave, where do you keep your Oscar? I keep it. Uh, I have a piano upstairs and uh, which like anybody else's piano is, you know, uh, covered with photographs and books and things that you set on it. And uh, it's kind of sitting there. And I, I always, uh, when people come over to the house and they don't, they've never been there before. Uh, I, it's always fun to see if they notice it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The su the subtlety yeah, of it. Yeah. You know, can I touch it? Can I pick it up? <laughs> oh, it's heavy. Can I take a picture. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. So you 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 um you, your credits on IMDb because that's normally our sort of source material for for seeing what people have done. Um, has you taking a bit of a sabbatical or a hiatus for some time, and then in two thousand and six, you're credited as being involved in David Arquette's. Um, tripper or the tripper is that correct yes yeah. uh, a good friend of mine from film school uh, was an actor in that film and he's a good friend of David Arquette's I'd actually met David Arquette uh, about uh, in the early 1990s through this friend of mine and uh, and so I used to make these real trippy super 8 films uh, when I was in film school and he said, Hey, you should come down and work on the tripper. <laughs> and, uh, Brilliant. so yes, I went down with another friend of mine and we spent, uh, three or four days on the location. Uh, we shot in big basin park, uh, which is a redwood forest. And, uh, you know, we did a couple of test shots and none of the stuff I did ever ended up in the film. <laughs> but I think Arquette actually gave us a credit in the film. So, yeah, uh, yeah he was very generous. And uh, so, you know, and I, I'm thrilled that I got a credit in the Internet Movie Database for that film. But more importantly, did you get the did you get the personalized poncho that apparently he gave out to a lot of the uh, crew members? If you didn't, I hope I haven't created a <laughs> scene. Um, I'm crushed. <laughs> yeah, apparently, apparently it rained so much during the filming that he uh, he he bought personalized ponchos for for all yeah. of the the crew that that yeah. were on set. Um, I I know you have to go soon, so we'll we'll keep it short. Um, for those budding filmmakers or, or photographers that are interested in getting into film or special effects or or, or anything along those lines, are there any pearls of wisdom that you could you could give or advice to your younger self that you'd give? Well, I mean, now the technology isn't an impediment to getting into the film business. Uh, when I was uh, getting into the film business, getting access to a camera or film stock or money to make a film, uh, it was a very uh, expensive and uh, it was pretty exclusive. Only a few people would have access to it. Now, like, you know, with an iPhone and iMovie, uh, you yeah. know, which everybody has, you can make a film. I, I'm reminded uh, of a quote. Uh, I, I think I heard it in film school. And uh, the, uh, uh, the artist, poet, filmmaker Jean Cocteau, who did uh, 
the uh, 1940s version of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, he said he didn't think film would ever be an art, a true artist medium until it was as cheap as an artist pen and paper to, yeah. to create art uh, because uh, the, the technology was reserved for, uh, the money was such a big deal in filmmaking. Well, it's not the case anymore. And I, I think it's created a revolution in filmmaking. You're seeing films come from amazing sources. Uh, so there's no excuse. Uh, I mean, if you want to get into filmmaking, make movies. Um, right. One what, what of the questions that we, we've been asking each other over the previous weeks, I don't know if Lloyd wants to ask this, um, it's a, it's a, your choice between a particular type of film or another particular type of film, um, you may be a bit biased given what you've worked on. I don't know if Lloyd, you want to ask the question? Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave you with this one after this, Dave. Um, so we just ask um, any guests this, we've asked each other this question. So it's basically, it's Star Wars universe or the Marvel universe. Marvel or Star Wars, which way would you go? Well, I kind of like this, the Marvel Universe. Uh, now, uh, I was a huge Marvel comic fan when I was a kid. And uh, I started reading uh, Marvel like when I was 11 or 12. Like it was Spider-Man was in issue three or four, I think. I wish I'd saved all those. And so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was a big Marvel fan uh, before Star Wars ever existed. So that was kind of, uh, and who would have thought that it would uh, be as big a deal as it is now? And, but I, you know, obviously I got a real nostalgia for the Star Wars universe, which I, I really consider Star Wars to be more of a, in the fantasy genre than science fiction. Uh, and so, and it's it's kind of locked into 1940s science fiction concepts. Uh, so, uh, you know, I love Star Wars, but uh, I, I think I would have to go Marvel. I think it has more possibilities. Cool. Thank, well, thanks very the, much, the, Dave. And the, it, the controversy continues. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I got to sign off. And Dave, you've you've been. A you've player. been Dave, you've been an absolute brilliant guest. Thank you. You're welcome back anytime. We may well be in touch again. Before you... Fantastic. <laughs> David, thank you very Cheers, much. Dave. Take care. Thank you very much. Okay. See you soon.